Let's read together Lord's Day 27, Lord's Day 27 of the Heidelberg Catechism. It's page 110 of the Green Creed's book in front of you. Lord's Day 27. Is then the external baptism with water the washing away of sin itself? Not at all. For the blood of Jesus Christ only and the Holy Ghost cleanse us from all sin. Why then doth the Holy Ghost call baptism the washing of regeneration and the washing away of sins? God speaks thus not without great cause to wit, not only thereby to teach us that as the filth of the body is purged away by water, so our sins are removed by the blood and spirit of Jesus Christ, but especially that by this divine pledge and sign, he may assure us that we are spiritually cleansed from our sins, as really as we are externally washed with water. Are infants also to be baptized? Yes. For since they, as well as the adult, are included in the covenant and the church of God, and since redemption from sin by the blood of Christ and the Holy Ghost, the author of faith, is promised to them, no less than to the adult, they must therefore by baptism, as a sign of the covenant, be also admitted into the Christian church, and be distinguished from children of unbelievers, as was done in the old covenant or testament by circumcision, instead of which baptism is instituted in the new covenant. This evening, beloved, we're going back to Lord's Day 27, as I said we would, because you'll remember that we jumped ahead to Lord's Days 28, 29, and 30 to deal with the Lord's Supper when we considered together and took on that sacrament. So now we're going to cover and return to the Lord's Day we missed. Our approach this evening will be somewhat different from usual. Often we focus on one passage of scripture or a few texts to prove the biblical and reformed teaching in our Heidelberg Catechism and to develop it. But this evening we are going to look at many texts or passages from the beginning to near the end of the Bible. So this may involve, if you're up for it, a fair bit of paging through your Bibles. I prefer it, if you would, but this isn't a binding regulation in any way. Whatever you find most helpful. This evening then, we're going to look at the grand sweep of scriptural teaching on the children of believers. This will be an overall scriptural perspective and will present a cumulative case and very practical conclusions will be drawn from it as we shall see. That is, especially if we've time to get to them because there's a lot to be said. Let's look then at believers' children in God's covenant and church. Believers' children in God's covenant and church. Very simply, We'll look at Old Testament teaching, New Testament teaching, and practical teaching. Old Testament and New Testament and practical teaching on the children of believers in God's covenant and church. We're going to start with very early Bible history in the Pentateuch, or the first five books of Moses. The mother promise itself, Genesis 3 verse 15, speaks of two seeds. The seed of the woman, which is Christ, and all those in him, and the seed of the serpent, which refers to the ungodly, which two seeds are always at war. 
few verses after that great mother cross, we read of the third and fourth mentioned believers in the Bible, and they are Abel and Seth, who were the sons of Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 5, we have the genealogy of the godly. In their generations, we have Adam, who begat Seth, and then after a few generations, we come to Enoch, who walked with God and was translated, for he was not, because God took him. Enoch's son was Methuselah, the oldest recorded living human being. Then we have Lamech, who named his son in faith, that son being Noah, through whom God granted rest to his people. And there we have the godly covenant line, the seed of the woman over against the seed of the serpent, the sons of God, chapter 5, over against the generations of the wicked from Cain in Genesis 4. Moving ahead a little to Noah, we have Noah's three famous sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and the first reference in the Bible to the word covenant, Genesis 6, verse 18, God's words to Noah. But with thee, and all the wicked are going to be destroyed, but with thee will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. The first reference to the covenant <coughs> makes very clear that it's a family covenant, a covenant in the line of generations with Noah's three sons, who were, of course, at this time, adults. And then in Genesis 17, God's one covenant made with Noah is further developed as the covenant with Abraham. And verse 7 is particularly important in this connection. God says, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee. In their generations for a everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. The generational aspects mentioned four times here. The covenant is made between thee and thee and thy seed after thee, number one, in their generations, number two, for an everlasting covenant, number three, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee, number four. God's making this covenant with Abraham and his seeds, his seed, includes certain responsibilities. Genesis 17, verse 9. Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. And what especially is it to keep the covenant here? Verse 10 continues. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. That in this passage is central to keeping the covenant. Circumcision of infants at eight days old and circumcision of older people brought into God's Covenant. The book of Genesis, the rest of it, is structured, as you know, upon Abraham's covenant line. Abraham, that's a narrative about Abraham, then his son Isaac, and God's covenant was contained with him, then Isaac's son Jacob, with whom God established his covenant, and then to Jacob's twelve sons, who in their generations became the twelve tribes of Israel. And when we move from the book of Genesis into the start of Exodus, we're confronted right away with another godly covenant.
Cobham family. Amram and Jochebed, the three Cobham children, the eldest being Miriam and Aaron and Moses. Moses wrote a lot about the Cobham, for he himself was a Cobham child in the Cobham nation. And in the last book, penned by Moses, that of Deuteronomy, Moses the preacher, by God's inspiration, reflects upon the covenant promise and lays down the covenant calling of believing parents. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. That is, teach your children to love the Lord thy God with all their heart, soul, and might. Thou shalt teach them diligently to your children. Talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you sit up. Bind them for a sign upon your hand. Make them as frontlets between your eyes. And write them on the posts of your house and on your gates. And then verse 10 concludes. And it shall be, when the Lord thy God shall brought thee into the land which he swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, the covenant promise, in the line of generations again, that you shall do this, and so forth. Now in the next chapter, we have the same point being made. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. Thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all the people that are on the face of the earth. And the Lord didn't love you or choose you because you are more than people, you are a paltry people. But verse 8 says, the Lord chose you and loved you because he loved you. That's sovereign love. And because he would keep the oath, the covenant oath he'd sworn to your fathers. No, verse 9 says, therefore the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. And that doesn't just mean a thousand generations, that doesn't just mean in the Old Testament. A thousand generations. Let's say a generation is 20 years old. 20 years. 20,000 years. A thousand generations. And God repays those who hate him to their face, those who rebel against his covenant, and he destroys them. And he's not slack to him that hates him. He will repay him to his face. And we should look now just at a couple of scriptures which reflect on Old Testament history. Because the groundwork's already laid in the Pentateuch. We sang earlier Psalm 105. Verses 8 through 10 read, God hath remembered his covenant forever. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. And within this covenant framework, the very last Old Testament prophet, Malachi states a major purpose of marriage in God's church. He asks and then answers his own question, why did God make one man and one woman, one flesh in the church? That he might seek a godly seed. That's one of the three major purposes of marriage. And from the perspective now especially of the church, that he may seek a godly seed, a seed of the covenant, from the offspring of believers in the church. 
But this covenant purpose of Israel is sung about a lot in the Psalms. This is Psalm 22, a messianic psalm, referring to the Lord Jesus in his mother's womb and on his mother's breasts, that is, in his earliest days. Christ confesses to God, Psalm 22, verse 9, But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope by the work of the Spirit in him. There is the grace of hope. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. That's trust. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. The Spirit within Christ making groans that cannot be uttered. And if we turn to Psalm 103, God explains his covenant mercy in these words, verses 17 and 18. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children to such as keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. And that verse 18 is a classic definition of keeping the covenant in terms of keeping God's commandments. That's what it means in short, to keep the covenant, to keep God's commandments out of gratitude. And if you say, well, maybe Psalm 103, 17 and 18, it's in the Old Testament, this covenant mercy stops in the Old Testament. But the passage says, that the mercy of the Lord in his covenant is from everlasting to everlasting upon them who fear him, and New Testament believers fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children. And we'll come back to these verses later. And then we have the two Psalms which we sing, one we sign and one we will sing. Psalm 127 and 128 two twin psalms you could say psalm 127 children are an heritage of the lord the fruit of the womb is his reward as arrows are in the hands of a mighty man so are children of the youth that is a godly father trains up his children to fight the battles of the lord by his word and spirit happy and blessed is the man who has his quiver full of such children they won't be ashamed they will speak with the enemies in the gate. Psalm 128 speaks wholly of the godly covenant family and of the blessedness of those who fear the Lord, who walk in his ways, who eat the labor of their hands. Things are well with them by God's grace. The wife is a fruitful vine with the sides of the house. Children are like olive plants round the table. This is the way that man will be blessed. Verse 4 says, God will bless that man in that home out of the church he will see the good of the church all his days and he will see his children's children in the faith and peace upon the Israel of God and so you may say well maybe those are just blessings for Old Testament saints and then you're tempted to echo the words but not imitate the character of Esau and cry out Lord have you a blessing for me have you anything left even for me? Does Jacob get it all? And then you say, no, these blessings to the godly in their homes and with their marriages and children rest upon God's everlasting covenant. And an everlasting covenant doesn't just stop with the Old Testament. And it's God's one everlasting covenant of grace. And if you want Old Testament passages speaking of God's continuation of his covenant into the New Testament age, we can easily give you several. Several confining ourselves even to the three longest Old Testament writing prophets. I'm speaking about Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. We'll start with Isaiah 44, 
Isaiah 44, verse 3. God's promise to his people. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit. And when would God pour his spirit? Especially, principally, Pentecost. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon my offspring. And they, the children of believers, the seed and offspring with God's spirit and blessing upon them, will spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. And one shall say, this is the children growing up now and becoming conscious of the faith that God has wrought within them, and confessing the truth that is in their heart, they shall say, I am the Lord's. And another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. I'm in the church. And another shall subscribe his hand unto the Lord, and surname himself by the name of Israel. Isaiah 59 is, if anything, even more clear a promise of the New Testament age, not so much from the work of the Holy Spirit, that Isaiah 44, but here from the coming of Christ. Isaiah 59, verse 20, And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. And the Redeemer is Jesus Christ. And, he, and Romans 11, verse 26, quotes this of Christ. He's the Redeemer who comes to Zion. He did that in the first century A.D. And then comes the common promise with believers and their seed. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, O Redeemer, O Christ, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, <coughs> believers, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, the children of believers, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever through the whole New Testament age. One more verse from Isaiah. Isaiah 61 verse 9. You're familiar with those great messianic words with which Isaiah 61 begins. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel and to heal and so forth, to proclaim the acceptable days of the Lord. And then God's going to build up his church again. And then verse 9 says, And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. There's three passages in Isaiah dealing with the New Testament age that says that God is going to bless the seed of believers there too, in his covenant and with his Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 32, we'll just take one passage from Jeremiah. Jeremiah 32, <coughs> verses 38 and 40. And you may remember that Jeremiah 30 through 33 is the great messianic portion of that book, those four chapters especially dealing with the messianic age. Jeremiah 32, verse 38, They shall be my people, and I will be their God, and I will give them one heart and one way. That's the language especially of Jeremiah and Ezekiel of the blessings of the Messianic age. I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, irresistible grace, for the good of them and of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. And finally, one passage from Ezekiel. Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. The latter part of that chapter which deals with the dry bones. Ezekiel 37, verse 24. 
and David my servant shall be king over them. That's Christ, here called David, because he is the son of David, and the ultimate man after God's own heart. David my servant shall be king over them, as he is king over us, and they shall have one shepherd, he's called the good shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments, and observe my statutes, and do them. Irresistible grace, the subjects of Christ the King, and the sheep of the Good Shepherd. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children, forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. Three passages from Isaiah, one from Jeremiah and Ezekiel saying, The Messianic age when David the king, Christ rules. When the Spirit comes, when the Redeemer comes to Zion, the children are included. And when we come to the New Testament, the New Testament <coughs> is God's blessing on believers and their seed. The New Testament scriptures begins with two baby boys. That's how New Testament Bible history begins as the children of catechism know. Two baby boys. The first of them is John the Baptist. This is what the angel Gabriel said in Luke 1 15 to Zacharias about the boy. So Luke 1 verse 15, he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. This boy, John the Baptist, had godly parents, Zacharias and Elizabeth. He was a child of the covenant, and he was regenerated in his mother's womb. He not only possessed the Spirit, but he was filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit, he recognized Christ, leapt in his mother's womb when Mary entered the house, carrying Christ in her womb, and he even leapt in his mother's womb for joy, Luke 144 says, because joy is the second fruit of the Spirit mentioned in Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and so forth. The second baby boy start of old of New Testament Bible history is of course the Lord Jesus Christ himself and part of the Magnificat my soul doth magnify the Lord the prayer and worship of Mary is Luke 1 verse 50 Mary says God's mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation <coughs> She is quoting there Psalm 103, verses 17 and 18, which we saw earlier. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children. His mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. The everlasting covenant of the promise with believers and their seed is still there when we come to the New Testament and the Gospel of Luke and the Virgin Mary quotes it. What then about Jesus Christ's attitude to children, children in Israel, children in the church? Matthew 18 is a good place to start. Matthew 18. The Bible has quite a lot to say about Christ's attitude toward the children of believers in the midst of the gospel narratives. Matthew 18 verse 6 says, Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, little ones, believing in Jesus, and if anyone does that, causes them to stumble or fall out of sin, it would be better for them 
and if a millstone were hanged around the neck, and they were drowned in the deeps of the sea. In the previous verse, Jesus says, Whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me, because Christ is in the children of believers, the elect, the regenerate seed. He's in them by his Holy Spirit. To receive them is to receive him. And so in verses 3 and 4, Jesus explains that the salvation of believers in the church isn't some really bizarre or unusual or weird thing, but rather God's saving children teaches a lesson even to adults and the way of salvation. Verily I say unto you, verse 3, except ye be converted and become as little children. Conversion, in a special sense, even of adults, is their becoming like children. And except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> God, even if he converts an adult, makes that adult like a child, humble, realizing that he is nothing. Because God's way of saving, historically in the Christian church and in the Old Testament, is ordinarily saving people as children. God brings in Gentiles. God works through mission work. But how does that mission work continue? Mostly through the salvation of the children of all believers. And even adults, when they're saved, become like children humble. They receive as truth what God says in the book. And they believe like children that a whale swallowed Jonah. And that on the third day, Jesus Christ likewise was raised from the tomb. Turning over a few pages in Matthew to Matthew 21, verses 15 and 16. This is Palm Sunday, as it is known. Christ has entered Jerusalem at the start of the chapter. Then, the next day, the Monday, we have Christ cursing the fig tree and cleansing the temple. And after he cleanses the temple, we read verse 15, When the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they didn't like Christ being worshipped by the children. They were so displeased and said unto him, Hearest thou what they say? Go on, rebuke them. Chase these children. And Jesus says unto them, Yea, have ye never read, Psalm 8, verse 2, Out of the mouth of babes, that's pretty small, as a child, as a babe, and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise. Then, of course, is that celebrated passage in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We'll take the version of Mark from now. Mark 10, verses 13 through 16. The little children are brought to Jesus. The disciples rebuke them and say, The Lord's a busy man. He wouldn't have time for children. Jesus says in verse 14, Forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. <coughs> These little children are in the kingdom of God. They're the citizens of the kingdom of God. God reigns over them by his grace and Holy Spirit. He takes them for the children of the kingdom. God is their king. They are his subjects. And so Jesus blesses them in verse 16 with a totally effectual and powerful blessing as the Messiah who is going to die for their sins because that's the only way to be blessed. You can only be blessed in Jesus Christ on the basis of his cross. He blesses them. He touches them. He lays his hands upon them and he takes them up in his arms into his bosom as the good shepherd carrying his lambs in his bosom as Isaiah 40 verse 11, that messianic prophecy, puts him. And so the risen Christ in his conversation with the apostle Peter by the shore of the Sea of Galilee tells that disciple, feed my lambs. Lambs. Not just sheep in Christ's church. Lambs. My lambs. Feed them. He says that to Simon Peter, the apostle, the chief of the eleven, doubtless one of the disciples who says, Jesus wouldn't be interested in the children. Mark 10. Don't be bringing them to him. Now Peter is told, not only must you allow them come to me, but you must go and teach them. Feed my lambs. 
When we come to the book of Acts, Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, we have the gospel promise in Peter's Pentecostal sermon, including the children of believers. Acts 2 verse 39, the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The promise is to you. The promise from the preceding verse is the promise of the Holy Ghost. The promised Holy Ghost is to you and to your children. The promise is the Holy Ghost as the Spirit of Jesus Christ whom he has poured out upon the church on that day of Pentecost. And he brings as the chief messianic blessing the first thing we all need, the forgiveness of sins in the blood of the cross. The promise is for you and your children. In the next chapter, Acts 3, verse 25, Peter preaches this. Ye are the children of the prophets, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed, Christ, shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. The kindreds there is families. Families. They will all be blessed. And not to you first, it was to your Jews, God has raised up the Son Jesus. And he's going to come with the same promise for the families of believers who are Gentiles. They're going to receive it too. The covenant with the Abraham is not going to leave out the children and families of Jews or Gentiles. <clears throat> and so as we move through the book of Acts, we read of household or family baptisms. Lydia. God had the Apostle Paul baptize her and her household or family. The Philippian jailer, Acts 16 as well. The household of Crispus, Acts 18, verse 8. And moving to the New Testament epistles, we'll start with 1 Corinthians because it has some <coughs> important things to say in this connection. Especially this epistle, this epistle which says so much about the unity of the church. 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 and 2 is a New Testament scripture speaking of an Old Testament baptism which included children. 1 Corinthians 10, moreover brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. How often doesn't Paul say that? He doesn't want people to be ignorant who don't know the scriptures. I don't want you to, to be ignorant of this. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They were all baptized, the children of Israel, including their children. In that same epistle, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 this time, verse 16, Paul says, and this is a New Testament baptism of children, families, household, and New Testament scriptures, I baptized also the household of Stephanas. And if you ask, why were the children of Israel, including their seed, baptized, according to 1 Corinthians 10, and why was the household of Stephanus baptized? And why were the other children that were in any other families and households baptized? You ask why? 1 Corinthians 7 verse 14 says, The children of believers are holy. Holy. Holy with the Holy Spirit working in their hearts, applying to them the redemption that they have in Christ Jesus. And therefore, holy baptism is administered to holy children. And 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 says, By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. It's a spiritual baptism. The spirit baptizes all the elect. That one spirit baptizes all into the body of Christ, into the place we have in that body. Whether we're Jews or Gentiles, whether we're bond or free, 
And whether we're young or old, and whether we're infants or people brought to their conversion as adults, all those in the household of Stephanus who were elect, who were baptized. And that water baptism, that external baptism, as the Catechism puts it, is a sign and seal of the real inward spiritual baptism. Briefly then, some other New Testament epistles. First, 2 Timothy 1 verse 5 refers to three generations of believers, Lois, Eunice, and Timothy. Very Lois, mother Eunice, and son Timothy. Three generations, which three generations, interestingly enough, and in various ways, straddle the Old Testament and New Testament. Granny, her daughter, and her grandson. That period where the old passed away and the New Testament form or ministration of the one everlasting covenant of grace took shape. Colossians is our next epistle. I hope you're able to hang in there. Colossians 3 verse 20 says, Colossians 3 verse 20, Children, obey your parents in all things. For this is well pleasing unto the Lord. And the only way a child can truly obey their parents, truly obey their parents so as to please the Lord, please him well, is if that child is a true, elect, regenerate, believing child of God, because all that is done outside of faith is sin. And only those who are justified and converted can please God. He's writing to the church of Colossae and he says, Children, you can please the Lord. Why? Because these children have been baptized, inwardly, spiritually baptized, of which the water washing is a sign and seal. Colossians 2 verse 21 says this about all true elect regenerate believers in the church of Colossae. In Christ ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Inward spiritual circumcision. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, which is to say the same thing as spiritual baptism, buried with him in baptism, where ye are risen with him through faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened <coughs> together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, and blotted out all the handwriting, the charges, you've sinned, you've broken this law, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was nailed to the cross, and Christ died for our sins, and removed it from us. That's Colossians. The argument from Ephesians is almost identical. Ephesians 6 verse 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment of promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. The only way you can keep that fifth commandment is if you have been redeemed and brought out of Egypt spiritually by the blood of Christ and are therefore thankful. Now you keep the Ten Commandments. Children are in the church in Ephesus, and the church in Ephesus consists, according to Ephesians 1 verse 1, of saints at Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Those who were, verse 4, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, including the children of believers, predestinated to be adopted as children, verse 5, redeemed in Christ's blood, verse 7, knowing the forgiveness of sins through the riches of his grace, and sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, verse 13. And so it is that Paul, in Ephesians 4, verse 5, says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One baptism for everybody in the church in Ephesus. It's referring to the one spiritual baptism. One baptism for them all. The children, the adults, the slaves, the free, the children, the believers, all those who are elect and given to Jesus Christ. Which one true spiritual baptism is signified to see in water baptism. The book of Galatians answers the question, who is the seed of Abraham, to whom all the promises are made? The seed of Abraham, Galatians 3 verse 16 says, separately, is Christ. 
he inherits all the blessings. And verse 29 says, that elect Jews and Gentiles who believe in Jesus are in him and partake of all the blessings and promises in Christ. So if the covenant of God with Abraham is a covenant made with Christ, and we're in Christ, and all the covenant blessings come to us, including the blessing of saving our children. Indeed, Galatians 3 verse 29 says not merely that we're in Christ, but verse 27 adds, For as many as you have been baptized into Christ by the Spirit, have put on Christ. One more passage before we go to the third point. The book of Romans. The book of Romans in chapter 11 describes how God saves his church. There's one church in all ages, Old Testament and New Testament. It says it's like an olive tree. And that olive tree in the Old Testament is primarily Jew Jewish. And there's branches in there. And the branches are various Jews in their generations. And with the coming of Christ, most of the Jews rejected him, and those branches were trimmed, pruned, cut off. And God puts new branches into that olive tree. And the Jewish branches were Jews and their generations. They were cut off. And the Gentile branches are also Gentiles and their generations. And so when God cuts someone off, it's not that a true believer is saved and lost. It's that that believer is cut off in his generation so that God doesn't save his spiritual seed. And the first practical lesson from all of this, especially given Lord's Day 27, is that we baptize our children in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Are infants also to be baptized? Yes. Why? Since they, as well as the adult, are included in the covenant, as we have seen, and church of God. And since redemption from sin by the blood of Christ, as we've seen, and the Holy Ghost, the author of faith, is promised to them, as we've seen, no less than to the adult, they must therefore by baptism, as a sign of the covenant, be also admitted into the Christian church, and distinguished from the children of unbelievers, as was done in the old covenant or testament by circumcision, instead of which baptism is instituted in the new covenant. And we do this because, and we must continually refresh our minds, we view our children not as little heathen or as little vipers, though they're far from perfect, they're sinful, and they have an old man just as their father and mother do, but we view them <coughs> as fellow saints, they're also our children, and to be directed and instructed and so forth, but they are fellow saints. They're God's children, and therefore they're our children. They're his regenerated and adopted children, and therefore God has willed that they be our biological children. God has effectually called our children, and therefore we are careful what we call our children. And we think with regard to our children, and this is Christian faith, we think of the three great things that our children are in. They're in the covenant. Therefore, they must keep the covenant. And they must keep the covenant by keeping the Ten Commandments out of gratitude and going to God as their parents do ask them for forgiveness each day. Our children are in the covenant. Our children are in the kingdom of heaven, as Jesus said. Therefore, our children, <coughs> as well as we, must live as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Willing citizens, obedient citizens, citizens of King Jesus who serve him and whose service is just as meaningful to Christ as the service of their parents in their 20s or 30s or 40s or whatever. The children are in the covenant in the kingdom of heaven and they're in the church. And so the children are called, just as much as the adult, to believe church doctrine Scripture, as it is faithfully summarized and confessed in the Reformed creeds, and to live worthy of being members of the church by God's grace. That's an obligation upon the children too. And as members, the 
children of believers can be cut off from the church too. And there is a sort of form of excommunication for them as well. And all of this practically involves an important calling to parents. Parents teach their children to pray, not to some abstract and only transcendent God. You must pray. Our great God, far off in the heavens, whom I do not know, you teach your children to pray. Our Father, as Christ teaches his children to pray, our Father, the opening words of the Lord's Prayer. We take our children to church to worship, to sing, to pray, to listen, to confess their sins too, because they have sins, like us. This is Joel 2. Verse 16, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breasts, and so forth. And that's why too, if possible, the church wants the children in the main room or sanctuary to be with us, if at all possible. That's the best situation if it's possible. Then it's easier for the parents and for the children to worship and sing or listen. It's more difficult upstairs in the balcony or in the cry room because you've got glass there, you're not with the other people. But of course, if children, this is a nappy children thing, or if adults with a terrible cough that disrupt everybody, then it is better to go outside because the idea is Maximum edification. 1 Corinthians 14 says there's no point if the minister preaches in a foreign language because nobody's going to be edified. You can hear it, but you don't understand. And if the minister is to preach and someone's coughing and they're making so much noise, everybody's running out of the door, the children are making such a noise that nobody can hear anything, nobody's edified. So you need to preach in the right language and in an environment where people can hear, right? And that's the idea. So as many people as possible can bring as much of themselves as possible into the worship service so that people can join in. And in the cry room in this new building, you can see, you can listen, there's a sound tuned in there. And the parents also train their children to listen so that their children and they can get into the main sanctuary as soon as possible and derive as much as possible from the worship service because it's harder in the cry room to worship than in with everyone else in here. But I'm only telling the obvious that everybody knows that. And it's very simple. Then of course parents take their children to catechism because they're mindful that Jesus Christ said, feed my lambs. And the parents prepare their children as the parents do in the church so they know their lesson. Also, as Reformed believers, if you and your husband are both committed to homeschooling and have the ability and resources, that's a very good, worthwhile thing to do. It's not easy though, it's difficult. The goal of this church, as any Reformed church is, to establish a Christian school. For that you need land, you need teachers, you need students, you need finance to pay for all this. And of course you need families who are strong and committed and willing to help out so that the congregation is united doctrinally. And then of course too, this truth that our children are in the church and covenant and kingdom of God means that parents discipline their children, not with the notion that the harder and more often I hit them, the better they'll turn out. But they discipline their children for sin, not merely because they annoy you, in love, not just because they annoy you, and aiming at their holiness. <coughs> and you don't just say, ah, oh, hard work this discipline, I'll just let this go, this sin. And it just shows how much I love them. I could have, I could have disciplined them there, but I'm not going to do it, I just love them so much. No, no, it shows that you can't be bothered, that you're lazy. And it shows actually if you don't think your children's 
salvation and holiness is important, and it shows ultimately that you hate them because you're not willing to put the effort into disciplining them. No, you discipline your children because you love them and because you believe that God loves them in Jesus Christ. There's one important thing that needs to be said, because it applies to everything, it needs to be said, not because you don't know it, but because it would be incomplete if it wasn't said. Obviously, not all of our physical children are elect. You know who the first physical child mentioned in the Bible is? Cain. And he was reprobated. Ungodly seed, though he was a physical child of believing Adam and Eve that God converted through the mother promise. Cain was of the seed of the serpent, the first child mentioned in the Bible. And you'll remember too that famous word of God, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. First uttered where? At Mount Sinai. Referring to what group of people? Israel, who've sinned at Mount Sinai with the golden calf. Well, Moses was up receiving the Ten Commandments and other revelation from God. And God says, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. In Israel, in the church, it's God's sovereign will to save some and not others. And so Paul quotes that verse, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy, and then adds a bit, and whom he will he pardons. As he did in Israel, and as he does too in the physical children of believers, because they are not all Israel, they are all Israel, and they're not all the children of Abraham who are the physical seed of the children of Abraham. 